question, Dr. Kitu, that was a real tour de force. Uh, so I have two options. I can take my discussants role as taking off on your comments on Asia, which would be interesting <clears throat> and perhaps controversial. So I shall avoid that or I can stick to my core competence as a macroeconomist and a public finance person who's actually interested in human development, which is why I spent the next 15 years in the UN system and after interning at the IMF <clears throat> and go forward with, with your very reflective comments, which uh, uh, I think coming to a head in changing intellectual discourse, particularly on what used to be called sort of the left of center. I'm beginning to see the beginnings of that happening. And it'll be interesting to see where this journey takes us. So let me sort of first, I'm going to pick and choose from different things that you, you mentioned. Let me start with the idea that the production process is decentralized. And that is what trade has been about over the last 20 years. And combine that with your comment about Seattle. What strikes me in the world today is that if there is one imperialism that is left, which is strikingly asymmetric in its application of rules, and as you said, for I think not very good reasons, <laughs> the North has a vested interest in maintaining those rules, it is the imperialism of knowledge. Because you can make all the iPhones you like in India and China or Kenya or in Nigeria, you can squabble about where they are made, but ultimately if you look at the first charge on the product and therefore the consequent profit, it belongs firmly to mines in Seattle. I'm mindful of the fact that the profits may be recorded elsewhere than in Seattle, but to the mines in Seattle. And then I begin to ask, are these profits policies or rents? And I begin to wonder whether the ability to, in an asymmetric way, overcome barriers to labor mobility by calibrating them in a way where you can attract the best mines in the world to provide you with rents is not something that makes logical, therefore, the pushback against the kind of globalization which could make those rents diminish. By which I mean, <clears throat> and there's one more building block which I'll come to here, which is just to take your conversation forward. This morning I was at a seminar on public health and our control and auditor general, who used to be finance secretary in Rajasthan, the Indian state, said Rajasthan produces 3,000 3, doctors a year and only 250 of them are available for government service and 1,000 of them go abroad. Now, that's a wonderful export. Uh, but what does it do, I ask? Does it bring rents to you? The fact that I do not celebrate particularly the fact that certain South Indian nerdy gentlemen are chairs of Google and things like that. That's fine. That's what nerds do. But what are they doing? Are they actually being imported as a factor of production to earn rents for the United States and for the North more generally? Or are they a genuine export where the benefit of their knowledge is going to the right place keep the market mechanism going. I think this sort of conversation about knowledge rents is going to become more and more important, particularly when you bring in artificial intelligence. So I'd like us to <clears throat> maybe contemplate that and bring that to the discussion. The, the second theme I want to fix on is the welfare state. Now, the welfare state, like Western civilization, according to Mahatma Gandhi, would have been a very good idea. But essentially what happened uh, with the welfare state, for the economists here, the technical term is the second theorem of welfare economics, uh, was an atrophy from the idea that, the, the political idea of a social contract where everyone was entitled to receive affordable public goods, if necessary at state expense, to the idea that a few people would make lots of money, and then the burden of attaining the desired income distribution, which is classic micro 201, not 101, would be that of the state. So if you take something like Finland, again today I had the Finnish ambassador in the morning, and I asked her, so 43% is the tax GDP ratio of Finland, but of that they only spend 20% on producing public goods. 23% is spent on taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. That's not a welfare state. That's a state in which productive inclusion, the participation of people in growth is not there. And therefore what the state has to do is the unpleasant business of taking the exposed benefits of growth and giving it to other people. That's what a universal basic income is. Now, so the trouble is that when we have this kind of situation emerging across the world, then to argue for expansionary macroeconomic policies becomes problematic because the system itself of production and consumption is broken. So if you're going to use expansionary macroeconomic policies like some in this country argue, I'm going to use that pulpit, 
to engage in something called counter cyclical policy. I, do, I don't understand why it is cyclical about all that. Somebody please show me a proper business cycle that's not a polynomial in three degrees, and then I'll believe you. A polynomial in three degrees is not a business cycle, it's a polynomial in three degrees. Uh, then we have got to ask, is something wrong with the way we are producing and consuming things? You guys are in Fiki. Why is auto sales the leading indicator of this economy? How many people consume cars? How many people consume two wheelers for that matter? Why is it that that's a leading indicator when India imports food, imports cheap clothing, can't build enough housing, can't provide, provides crap health, provides crap education? So this is something wrong in the economic structure, which is where macroeconomics should focus, rather than in sort of making up for the fact that we don't have inclusive growth. I think that is going to be an important feature in discussing what you said, trade and deep cut. My penultimate point is on, conscious of time, is on uh, trade as an engine of growth and the place we find ourselves. I think there are two dimensions there which are very important. The, and it's confused in India, so I'll take this opportunity to try and clarify it. We are not going to be able to engage in transforming our society on the basis of export-led growth. Because that is not how relative prices have moved in the world. The, however, uh, therefore our growth will necessarily have to be domestically driven. I'll, I'll touch on that before moving to my final point. However, the one lesson we can take away, which I have examined and surprisingly few people have examined, is when countries did deliver export-led growth, Korea, Taiwan, China, and countries like Brazil, Turkey, what was the difference in terms of what they did with the benefits of that export-led growth? In Korea and Taiwan and China, to some extent, there was a large plowback into non-trade rights. They invested in health, they invested in education, they invested in public systems. Only a portion of the dividend from export-led growth went back into more export-led growth or manufacturing growth or growth in GDP from that level. So they actually made a systemic choice in terms of production and consumption patterns. Brazil did not, Turkey did not. They moved into a middle-income trap. So I think another lesson from trade and development which resonates from the development end is what, what do you do with the proceeds of growth when you invest in it? The lesson we get from the world of export-led growth is those countries that exported and did not reinvest in improving what was the productive potential of their own economies entered a middle-income trap. And I'm very concerned that you're going there now in this country. On uh, my final point, which is the point that is closest to my heart, which is on taxation. Uh, we've had flags of convenience for a long time in shipping, Panama, Greece. So what is it with taxation that is so bad about taxes being collected uh, in locations where they are low? Uh, for me as an economist, that seems logical if I'm able to do it. There must be some normative principle there, and here is our, I think, permanent difficulty, which speaks to your multilateralism projects. Taxation, as we think about it in the world, is essentially a Westphalian concept, by which I mean a concept about nation states. I've always found it extremely unequalizing and harsh, particularly in the context of Africa. When you have a country like the Central African Republic, and I'll say it today openly, I've said it publicly before, is never going to be self-sustaining on the basis of a tax GDP ratio. Never, never, ever. Or Haiti, or a bunch of countries in the Caribbean. And to maintain this fiction of mutually and self-sufficient Westphalia, that the Committee of Nation States will forever be sustainable, if only we change rules, I think is a hypocrisy we need to drop. But if we drop that hypocrisy, then the entire debate on tax becomes problematic, because the moral obligation, that is a multilateral obligation, that certain things require transfers of money across international jurisdictions to be effective, is the real moral obligation driving multilateral cooperation on development. It conflicts in major part with the principle that countries are entitled to the taxes that they are because they are nation states, either because the companies that are producing stuff are selling it in those nation states or because they're deriving income in those nation states. I think this is the major stumbling block which with, with taxation is very similar to the now dead, that French, the French president, I can't remember his name, argument about global airline tax. Who asked this question 15 years ago, who's going to collect that tax, where are you going to deposit it, and how are you going to divide it between treasuries? There's only one institution I could see, then the Bank for International Settlements, and everyone said they can't be that. I said, there you go. You have a Westphalian problem. You want to think in terms of nation states, but you want to address a development problem that transcends nation states. And your tax conundrum, theoretically, 
is sort of stuck there. And I think this is a very useful area where Ankit could perhaps come in. You've done very good work on tax in the past. And actually fly this flag about, I'd say about five years ahead of its time. It's going to come there. Uh, you saw this sort of the, the, the counterpart to Bali. And what you were saying is Addis. I've, I've just spent two months in New York uh, with the head of UNDP and the SG. And I was very amused that everything I wrote about the SDG financing strategy would come back saying, you haven't said Addis is game changing. I said, it's not game changing. It was an abject failure. We sent our junior most minister of finance. Why did we do that? You know, we're not stupid. We'd send someone if something was happening there. The one thing we could not get there, which is some move towards a multilateral tax rules mechanism embedded in the UN, was disrupted by no less the US. So I'm echoing your points. And the only time in my life, hopefully, that the US ambassador to India called me was before Addis, saying, I understand that you support this UN thing. Let me try and change your mind. And I was shocked at how seriously they took it. But that is how it was. And again, there you have this Westphalian pitch. Finally, I want to make a point about a, a, a sort of speculative point for a minute. But before that, a small point, a question for consideration. We talk about trade and investment. But today we see more and more that finance mediates that conversation. And the rules of finance are settled in places which are very different from the rules of trade and investment. The rules of trade and investment more or less now are settled in Geneva with lots of people squabbling. And we have a 50-year learning process to this. We have no such learning process on negotiating rules of finance. So, for instance, when I learn that the very profitable $100 billion soft bank loan given to India to invest in renewable, mm -hmm. renewable energy by the Japanese, I was wondering why they give us this money. It's practically free. And then I find that the first charge on that loan is to the intellectual property behind those solar panels, which by agreement we have to buy from Japan. And this has implications. That's first charge, 17%. Uh, by my calculations of the revenue streams, if all these projects are successful, will flow right back to the pension funds of old people in Japan. And so we'll again have a situation where the world's children are, are our own, but we in the South are going to be investing to pay for old people in the OECD, thanks to intellectual property. This uh, finance intervention into the relationship between trade and investment is understudied. I think we need to study it from the perspective of what private finance, and this is where Agenda 2030, I think, is very useful, where the rules of private finance, where they facilitate trade in ideas and minds, not in hands and tools, as you were saying, and this will get even worse with AI, et cetera, where those intermediations actually require us to think about trade more broadly, possibly the standing conference on trade that is WTO, needs to expand to a standing conference on trade and finance, I don't think. That sort of ideation is necessary. The final point I'm going to make is a purely theoretical point. We are both ex-academics, uh, which is an interesting one to imagine. So if you have international trade, there are three possible solutions, right? Some which is, one is what we have today. Some countries have trade deficits. The other has trade surpluses. The net global result is zero. The other equilibrium we could have is that every country has balanced trade with every other country. And, and the third equilibrium you could have is every country is autonomous. These are corner equilibrium in a three-dimensional space. And the conversation we are having now starts at a particular equilibrium, where the world is balanced. So sigma exports minus imports is zero, right? But some countries are Xing and some are Ming, and the countries that are Xing are shifting, and the countries that are Ming are shifting. And what Trump is saying is, I don't like this, and I, as far as I can see, what he's proposing is, every country must do X minus M is equal to zero, therefore sigma X minus M is equal to zero. Fine. What are the implications of those to that? Are there efficiency losses? Are there efficiency gains? or the distribution implications? Let's take Trump seriously and find out as a research agenda. And the other, of course, is to compare that, benchmark that with the autarky rule, which is no country trades. Everyone stays there where they are. And their trade theory tells us that we'll come to some simple conclusions, but we can actually calculate the welfare losses. That last point was just in conclusion to tell you, Mr. Kituyu, how stimulated I was with your talk. I now know and remember every day why I miss the UN family. It's leaders like, like you in the governance space that have made it fun because the UN, unlike the bank or the fund, for me, has always been about ideas changing minds and not money changing hands. So this was a fascinating evening of ideas, and thank you, Pradeep and Sanjay, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you.